seat. We gotta wait a while. We got a room full of teachers. Oh. <laughs> hey, my wife's a teacher. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of its members is present, that the meeting has been duly called, and that the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance to Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6 p.m. Um, item number 1A, invocation, Mr. Scott Moore. If you're so inclined, would you please rise and join me in prayer? Almighty God, you truly are the God of all people in all places at all times. We may have different names for you, we may worship you in different ways, but at the end of it, we are all seeking the same thing, to know something beyond ourselves, to know something greater than ourselves, to know a peace in this life and beyond, to know a love which passes our own understanding. As we come to this place, we ask that you help us to lay our personal agendas, our egos aside, that you would place clearly before us your will for this district. We give you thanks for the honor of serving alongside those who have dedicated their lives to instructing our children, to those educators, administrators, paraprofessionals, support personnel. We give you thanks for all that they bring to this district and this community. We pray now that you would guide our discussions and our decisions, that everything that we do, everything that we say, would be to glorify you and be in accordance with your will. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Presenting the colors tonight, we're honored to have the color guard from the Willens College Park High School Marine Corps JROTC. Second Lieutenant Evan Clifton, Staff Sergeant Rihanna Karen, Staff Sergeant Nicholas Watson, and Staff Sergeant Ethan Hernandez, under the direction of Major Cody Stewart. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Standing job. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for the invocation. Mr. Husband for the Pledge of Allegiance. Item two, awards and recognition. 2A, special district recognition. Conroe ISD, Board of Trustees. Dr. Well, no. As we celebrate Board Appreciation Month, you can see that we have uh, many representatives from our campuses here tonight. And to speak on behalf of our principals and all of our personnel, I'll invite Ms. Lindsay Ardwan, our principal at Clark Intermediate, to come forward. President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, it is my honor to stand in front of you as spokesperson for all of Connor ISD administrators, educators, staff members, and students to personally thank each and every one of you for all that you do for the Conroe Independent School District. Daily, you demonstrate strength and dedication as you focus on excellence for CISD communities, 
teachers, staff members, and most importantly, our students. You unselfishly contribute your time and talents towards the advancement of our schools and the students we serve. You are extraordinary individuals who have voluntarily tackled the enormous job of governing our school district. Your actions and decisions affect the present and future lives of our children. Though we are making a special effort this month to show our appreciation, please know that every single one of us are thankful for all you do 365 days a year. Our students have demonstrated their appreciation by providing the cards, posters, banners, small gifts, drawings, and all the candy that you see here tonight. Please accept these tokens as our expression of thanks for your leadership, support, and for the numerous hours you give to make our district the outstanding place that it truly is to live, work, and go to school. In many ways, you are helping to ensure that our students graduate with confidence and competence. In doing so, you are also helping to build strong families and a caring and active community. I ask all in attendance tonight to join me in a round of applause to honor and thank the CISD Board of Trustees for their hard work, dedication, and commitment to creating a bright future for all of our students. Thank you all so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Ardron. And please send our thanks to all the kids for all the wonderful, wonderful gifts back here. I know a lot of hard work and effort was put in on behalf of the uh, staff as well as the kids, so we really appreciate that. Every year you guys do such a phenomenal job of bringing us goodies, and um, my, my kids and I really enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking forward for me to get home right now. <laughs> so uh, really thanks, and sincerely thank you from uh, myself, and I, I know I speak on behalf of the rest of the board when we say we really appreciate that and that doesn't go uh, unnoticed. So thank you guys, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Item 2B, citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey, has anyone signed up? Yes, we have two people signed up. All right. <clears throat> the next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are placed that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of more than five must appoint uh, a representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Goffrey, please call the first person who signed up to address the board. Sarah Pounders. Hi, my name is Sarah Ponders, and I just was going to speak to you related to the attendance boundary process and uh, the proposal that was recently submitted and posted on, the, on your website. Um, I'm from Glenlock Elementary School, and on, in the proposal you'll see that it is saying that our attendance zone will now be 530 students. And I just wanted to um, point out, although I'm sure you've noticed, is that currently we have 277 students and out of our 692 students that attend that are outside of our attendance zone. And I attended the November meeting, com community meeting, and discussed the fact that we have such a large um, percentage coming from outside of our <coughs> attendance zone. Those numbers do not necessarily um, reflect. Um, and I was told that 100 of those students would, with the new proposal, move to their home campus of Lamar. And I still do the math, and I'm getting that there's 177 students then proposed that will still be attending our school from outside of our attendance zone with the new proposal. And I feel that it's very misleading the way it's currently written in the proposal because it's just a footnote that special programs are um, not included in the overall numbers. And to me, 177 students is a lot of students to be listed in the footnote of um, the proposal. 
So as you discuss this today, I just wanted to make sure that that large percentage of our population was going to be discussed um, and not just written as a proposal and that the numbers that are that are shown are, if you do the math, if, if nothing else changes, you would end up, our numbers would be 707 students total in the new proposal. So, um, you know, as you, I know that you all know that, you know, when you add portables, you don't add bathrooms, you don't change the size of the cafeteria, you don't change the size of the library or the nurse's office or a lot of the support staff. And so I just want to make sure that consideration was made and not overlooked by being a footnote. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Ms. Coffin. Emily Hoppel. Good evening once again. Thank you uh, for the time. Um, my name is Emily Hoppel. I was here last time, so maybe a little familiar face now. Uh, I am a mother of CISD children and a taxpayer in the district. Um, and I'm here tonight to give you my huge support of this proposed bond and election. Um, so far, all I've been able to see is what's been in the papers, and I have read a lot of the detailed information, and what I see when I look at this bond is much needed improvements all across our district. Um, I also obviously see some, some improvements for the, the schools that my children will attend, which make me excited. Uh, I do feel strongly that no matter where in the district our kids live, that they are entitled and deserve the high quality education that we're giving to kids in our best schools. So um, specifically, the three dedicated gymnasiums made me really excited. I hope that the district will continue to provide a dedicated gymnasium for every school. Having um, children in two different elementary schools, I've seen the difference on a day-to-day -day basis of our child who got to have gym, have PE every day versus our child who did not get to have PE every day because their school has to cycle 720 children through lunch every day and cannot possibly get those same children through for gym as well. So um, the one item that I think is causing some concern is the pool, and I understand there might be some conversations about the pool. Um, I personally think athletics are an important part of our education as well, but um, I obviously want to make sure that we're being as careful as we can. I know that some people in our community will focus solely on the potential for a one cent tax increase over the next three years, um, perhaps not even giving any attention to any specific details of what will be in our bond proposal. <clears throat> However, I do believe that most people in our district understand that this board has in the past been, been very prudent with our tax dollars. Um, that your projected tax increases have not manifested and it, when they ha there has been an increase it has been much smaller than was projected. And I trust that you will do the same this time. Um, one other thing I want to point out is that strong schools are very good for our property values. So um, I guess I would ask people who may not support this bond, what the impact will be on our home values if we have to squeeze an additional 13,500 students into our existing school buildings. And you're hearing from another school tonight. Um, my elementary school that my children are zoned to, I think has eight portables this year. Um, so yeah. With, be very stressful for our current situation if we don't get this much needed infrastructure. And um, I think that my last closing statement would be, uh, if we want to continue the Texas miracle, we need to invest in education. I severely hope that the folks in our district will um, support this bond. And if you do, please talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, and get people to show up on May 4th. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Hopper. Appreciate that. <laughs> Coffee. I'm calling you next. All right. Item three, consent agenda. I've had no request to move anything. I move the agenda be adopted as 
Second. I have a motion, second. Discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor? All opposed? Passes. <clears throat> all right, item four, curriculum. Consider approval of contracts and solution tree for professional development. Dr. No. I will ask Dr. Shelley Winkler, our Director of Elementary <clears throat> Education, to present this item. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. Each summer, our teachers and administrators are dedicated to growing as professionals by seeking out various training opportunities. To fill this need, the district routinely sends its educators to events hosted by Solution Tree, a world-renowned authority on professional learning communities. These trainings primarily focus on strengthening our campus professional learning communities, which promotes teacher collaboration and raising student achievement. Historically, these summer events are held in San Antonio and more recently Fort Worth. The registration fee to attend a conference of this caliber can be almost $700 for each staff member. Because of this cost, it limits the number of people that are able to attend this valuable training. Additionally, since these conferences are held outside of the Houston area, staff members must stay overnight, resulting in additional costs to the district. Marzano Research also conducts these various events um, during the summer that focus on high-impact strateg instructional strategies, and Mar Robert Marzano's educational research and practices are at the core of our curriculum and instructional practices in Connor ISD. Marzano Research events have most recently be been held in Austin, Rockwall, and Denver, Colorado. These events have a similar registration fee of $650 for each participant. Solution Tree, in conjunction with Marzano Research, has agreed to host a two-day professional development event in CISD for 600 of its educators. The event will be hosted at Grand Oaks High School on June 17th and 18th. Mike Matos, Dr. Anthony Mohammed, Dr. Tammy Helferbauer, and Dr. Phil Warwick, all recognized presenters and authors, will be keynote speakers. Nine additional researchers and practitioners will conduct breakout sessions on various topics such as response to intervention, student engagement, <coughs> teacher self-care, and components of high reliability schools. The cost to the district for this two-day event is $163,400. This is a significant savings to the district as it avoids paying the high registration fees and travel costs associated with attending training outside of the district. If the district elected to send 600 educators to one of these conferences outside of the district, registration alone would cost the district approximately $415,000. This potential cost does not factor in the added expense of travel and lodging. <coughs> Investing in our educators is vital, and we are excited to provide them with access to highly, a highly sought after presentation from researchers uh, with Solution Tree and Marzano Research at an affordable rate. At this time, we ask the board to approve the contract for professional development with Solution Tree to serve our educators in a two-day summer staff development opportunity. I'll move we approve as presented. Have second. A, have a motion, have a second. Any discussion? All right. Would, uh, just, just in a positive note, I want to say that our district does a wonderful job of sending two people to Seattle or wherever and bringing back the info. But every once in a while, we need to reach outside, you know, our, our presenters and hear from the source of these, of these strategies, so to speak. And I'm excited about this, very excited. But having talked to teachers all around the district, <coughs> I, I commend the district for, and the administration for bringing this forth. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Motion second. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Winkler. Appreciate it. All right. All, uh, item five, administration. Consider approval of 2019-2020 school calendar. Dr. No. All right. Dr. Hines, present. <clears throat> Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, tonight we wanted to present to you um, the school calendar uh, process and the uh, recommendation from the district level planning committee for your approval. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background or to recap the timeline, in October uh, the district level planning committee began to discuss possible calendars 
Uh, in November, um, if you may recall, we brought forward to you just as an information item to get some feedback on the calendar process. Uh, we also uh, had a meeting after the board meeting uh, the next day, and we started working on developing drafts. Um, and then we posted those drafts in late November, and they, they remained up on our website for roughly a month, and we uh, received about 2,200 comments um, in return. Uh, and the committee came back on January the 9th, uh, again, to discuss and uh, decide on the recommendation that we bring forward to you tonight for your uh, consider consideration and hopefully your approval. Uh, the, recommend the recommendation from the district level planning committee is calendar draft two, uh, and we just want to give you a few highlights. Uh, first of all, the our district of innovation status allows us as a school district to begin school prior to what would be the uh, fourth Monday, August the 26th. Uh, so f on this calendar, the first day of instructions for students will be Wednesday, August the 14th. The staff development days would happen uh, in front of that. Uh, the calendar contains the required 75,600 minutes of instruction. The calendar makes the assumption we'll assume our current 430-minute school day. Um, it's a little bit longer at the high schools, which provides the additional minutes that are equivalent to two inclement weather makeup days, should those be needed. Those will be in the calendar. Uh, <coughs> students attend school under this calendar for 177 days of instruction, and teachers work 187 days. Uh, the district does, and, and just one of the kind of the quirks of this process, we're, actually, we're, we're asking you to approve the calendar, but it is based on the assumption that we'll continue some waivers, and that waiver process does not open until the late spring, so usually April, May before that process begins. Uh, and we have, in the past several years, the calendar's been brought forward, forward to you with the same assumptions. Uh, we have uh, currently, it would be a waiver for those staff development day minutes. It allows us to count the minutes. Uh, that we have and there would be two staff development days in this calendar that we would be counting the minutes as well as four early release days For the calendar uh, I mentioned when school would start there is a uh, Early release day in October. There's a holiday in October. There is the week off of uh, November 25th through the 29th for Thanksgiving the winter break would begin on Friday December the 20th and extend through uh, January the seventh um, we uh, the first semester um, has 84 instructional days the second semester which begins January the 8th would have 93 instructional days the last day of instruction for students would be May the 28th uh, and if you'll note uh, there's a staff development day on November the 11th uh, as well and that's a new feature uh, this year uh, spring break would be March 9th through the 13th. There was a lot of feedback on the spring break and the comments, uh, and it was a very kind of a mixed feeling about it because uh, you know we a lot of us like the later spring break. However, uh, we'll note that Texas A&M, Lone Star College, and Sam Houston State all have that earlier spring break, and many of our students go to those institutions. We also noticed that uh, Sci Fair and Katie also have that earlier spring break, so it seems to be very popular. Uh, time so we recommend that earlier spring break of March the 9th through the 13th uh, and I mentioned there's four early release days I mentioned the October one there's one right uh, in December one in March uh, right before the spring break uh, which is the end of the grading period and then May the 28th which is the last day of school um, a couple of things worth noting during the discussion uh, there was a discussion about the November election day um, and it didn't make it into this recommendation. I, I would not be surprised if it didn't come back in next year's calendar as a recommendation for a staff development day. Um, but it, it didn't make it in, but there was a lot of discussion about it. And the other thing that there was a lot of discussion about uh, ending the school year prior to Memorial Day, and there was a lot of look at that. Uh, we didn't bring forward that recommendation this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't come in next year, but I, I don't want to speak for next year's district level planning committee. Uh, but that is our recommendation, and we ask for your approval of draft two. Could you go back and pull the calendar back up real quick? Thank you. I move approval. I second. 
I have a motion and a second. Discussion, gentlemen? Sick question. Uh, sure. yeah, Go ahead, I'm sorry. So on the increment, increment weather days that need to be made up, if by chance, I don't think this ever happened, but that doesn't, we actually don't have any increment weather days. At what point do you, are, are there additional days somewhere where they, that the kids have off, or is it just we, we win extra days that year? And can we it's, carry them over to next year? <laughs> <laughs> can we bank them? <laughs> Minute, minutes in the bank. Uh, it's it's uh, they're not refundable, so we put the we put the minutes in there, and, and if we if we need them, they're there. If we don't use them, we got don't it. Use them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Emma. This may not be a big issue to some, but how will the teachers feel about this schedule? I see that eight fourteen, and you said the teacher starts before that. Yes. You got good feedback from the teachers on. Yes, we've you know we've over the years we've had mixed feelings about different calendars. Uh, I would say it's not nothing about the calendar is unanimous. I will say that okay. uh, in, the, in the process, I think there's different viewpoints and people like different features. Uh, but we've enjoyed. I think the general overall feeling is people enjoyed the earlier start because it enabled us to get that October holiday back, enabled us to uh, also. Um, balance the semesters a little bit better. So particularly the high school one semester teachers really like that. So it gets us a little bit better. Um, so those are some of the positive features that we've heard. Okay, thank you. On, on this particular calendar though, is, is it fairly supported? I know it wasn't unanimous, but. Yes, this, I mean, uh, is... clearly of the, of the two that we put up there, this was the two to one preferred calendar. Okay. One, one question I have is, when are AP exams in May? That's so what, that's what the, the problem was. that was one yes, of the it, sticking the points short spring semester and this is better because we start earlier but it still kind of rushes things doesn't it well this actually is the you know what where the rush would have been is trying to end um, memorial. before Memorial Day because we would be going right out of AP test into final exam period um, the other complication was the state in the original assessment calendar had us testing what would have been the last week of school up to the last day of school for a junior high and intermediate school. So that wasn't, but the state changed the assessment calendar in late December, and so that's no longer a conflict. <clears throat> but but at that time when we were discussing this, that was something in our consideration. But that for the high schools, that's probably one of the biggest challenges getting out before Memorial Day. It condenses that end of the year. I think the feedback is if we have time to plan we can work around it but it is it does put a lot at the end of the year in a short period of time any further discussion Got a motion second all in favor all opposed passes you know motion. Good job, man. thank you uh, dr. Hines. thank you item 5b consider approval of attendance zone recommendation associated with the opening of such elementary school dr. no all right dr. Hines. thank you I'll just just go right into it um, thank you very much. We have um, started a rezoning process this year, um, and just to kind of recap, um, there will be a, we will be opening a thousand student elementary school, Suchma Elementary. It will be serving students in kindergarten through sixth grade, and that's going to open in August. And we're still planning to do that. You'll get the update from Mr. Foster here uh, momentarily. Uh, it's going to be located on the south side of 242, not too far away from Irons. Um, junior high, it's across the street from uh, Montgomery Creek Ranch. It is in the Harpers Preserve neighborhood and it's located at uh, 1,000 uh, or 10,261 Harper School Road. And this is kind of a rendering of the campus. When we started this process, there we wanted to look at a lot of things, but certainly first and foremost, we want to develop the attendance boundary for the new Suchma campus. Um, and we still want to leave a little bit of room for growth. Uh, we also want to look at providing some crowding relief to Oak Ridge, Hauser, Ford, and Vogel um, that are all within that feeder. Um, we also, as we started looking at it, we, we wanted to look at could we do anything for Ride and Haley as a result um, of this new campus. So um, the committee began to do this. We formed a committee, and they have been a great committee. And I've, we've been meeting really since um, September. and. Uh, They've done an outstanding job. I don't know if we have any of our committee members here. If you want to wave, we have a few people that are here. Thank you very much. They've been uh, outstanding in their service. And, so any uh, flack we get, we just 
That's it. That's all right. That's it. Direct uh, to you. All right. But they've done a great job. And we had representation from several schools and parents that participated. And I will say they really did work at it. They wanted to understand the numbers and just, you know, we gave them all kinds of information and they absorbed it and worked on it. Uh, we had, we probably looked at, uh, I'm guessing, 40 or 50 different scenarios or versions of scenarios through this whole process to model out different outcomes. Um, to do this, we started, we also scheduled um, kind of three rounds of public presentation, one to talk about the process, one to get some <clears throat> feedback, and then we took the feedback, went back and worked on it, and uh, came up with a recommendation that we're going to bring, we bring to you tonight. Um, and then we certainly want to address uh, some of the things. As, as we look at the process, um, you know, most of the area that's going to be impacted is going to be uh, the area around Suchma. And one of the things that the committee found early on, we started doing the numbers, and we knew this going in, but for the committee it was kind of an aha moment of there are a lot more students that live in this area that are going to fit into that school. And so we had to make some decisions and, and, and work through the process of who's going um, and, and work through it. Uh, so that kind of drove the basis of it. And then from there it becomes kind of a, a stair step of capacity is created at Oak Ridge Elementary, <coughs> capacity is created at Hauser Elementary, and then looking at how we can begin to move from there to maximize all those campuses. And that really is what makes up the recommendation that we're bringing to you tonight. The Attendance Boundary Committee recommends that you approve the boundaries that are reflected in Scenario 1.2. And we certainly recommend further consideration be given to looking at ways to reduce the crowding at ride um, that we didn't really solve through this process. But I, I do want to stress that really was never our first and primary objective. We really were working on Suchma, and we were just looking at that to see if we could do something. Um, but we, we, we still need to do some work and look at that, um, but we're not, we're, we, we don't feel like this process enabled us to get the full view. We shared with you the demographic study results um, just recently and, and certainly last month, uh, and that gives us new information to begin planning, and we'd like to do more work on that, but be more comprehensive uh, in that, as we were in this Oak Ridge feeder in the, the uh, Haley uh, and Lamar areas that we looked at carefully. Just try to give you some of the highlights in what we bring forward in scenario 1.2. In the light green part of the map um, that is up here um, recommends what would be the new attendance boundary zone for Suchma. Uh, the kind of this, the, the cream color moving along the corridor is Oak Ridge Elementary. Um, and so really we carved out from Oak Ridge Elementary and Hauser this, this attendance zone, this one section. It's a very small section. Zone 33F is actually zoned to San Jacinto uh, and Grangerland, it's, but it's only nine students. Um, but that, that section's pulled into this as well in K-6. Um, the short of it, the, the kind of the quick summary of what, what's all included, um, we looked at the tall timbers um, uh, north of 242 and Glen Eagles north of 242 were not included <coughs> because that the number of students just exceeded the capacity at that point. So we, we, we remain, those sections remain at Oak Ridge Elementary. Um, we would anticipate opening with roughly 850 students. And that's, and I want to mention that because I think it is to, to clarify uh, about numbers, our numbers are geocode numbers. So when we present enrollment numbers, it's based on the number of students who live in that attendance boundary. Attendance, attendance at school may change based on programs such as a bilingual program or special education program. Uh, we administratively move those from time to time based on our needs, based on where our students are coming from, and that's not something that we did through this process. So we do not do special programs. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll speak a little bit more about the bilingual program at Glenlock in a minute, but um, I did want to share that that's a geocode number. It doesn't mean we'll have that many students there because there may be a program that takes students away from the school or may mean students are brought in for a program. Uh, and those will move. Uh, but I'm assuming you're using it because it's fairly accurate. It's pretty accurate. I mean, we use the geocode, but, but the geocode doesn't tell the whole story of what a, where a school might end up. Another source of students are teacher transfers for their children. So, yeah. so at uh, 707, the bottom line is what is the capacity of Glenlock? So, um, 
I will tell I mean, you. If it's at 707 and the capacity is 7, it's about, that might be a problem, but if the capacity no, is 8. Well, it's the capacity is in the 6s. Um, so Glenlock, to answer your question about uh, Glenlock, let me pull it up here. So Glenlock Elementary has a capacity of 600 and currently has an enrollment of 692 students. Um, there's five portables at Glenlock Elementary. There's currently 240, roughly, and this changes every day, 240 bilingual students at Glenlock Elementary. Glenlock Elementary has served as the bilingual program for the, for the entire Woodlands area for several years now. Um, the students come from every school in the Woodlands. So there's two students from Buckaloo that are at Glenlock for bilingual. Uh, there's 14 students at Bush Elementary from Bush. There's five students from David. There's eight students from Derrickson. There's four students from Gladys. There's 15 students from Glenlock, and I can go on and on. Uh, there's roughly 130 from Lamar. And those 130 students under our plan would be able to go back to Lamar for bilingual services. We don't want a bilingual program to be too small because it's inefficient for us to administer. And so our goal is never to, is always to try to hit at least 90 to 100 range. Um, but what we will essentially be doing under this proposal is splitting the bilingual program at Glenlock between Lamar, which will be housing its own program for students that live in their attendance boundary, and Glenlock will continue to host the bilingual students for the rest of the schools that send students there currently. And what will that bring Lamar, oh, Lamar to, and what is Lamar's capacity? So Lamar's capacity currently is 770, and currently there's 767 students. And under this proposal, Lamar will end up about 750 students. Um, and so, and I'll kind of walk you through what all the little differences are. But really for Lamar and Glenlock, there's very little change in their enrollment under this proposal. Mm -hmm. Um, now, what we do think we'll accomplish with Glenlock is we'll slow the growth because most of the growth at Glenlock has been through the bilingual program and most of the students are coming from students that live in the Lamar zone. But we do anticipate Lamar may continue to grow a little bit in because they'll be able to serve more of their home students in their program. Um, so I'll kind of kind of taking you through uh, zone 58, which is south of of sawdust east of Pruitt, which has 103 students in the Lamar boundary under this proposal, will move to Hauser because we have room at Hauser. Um, the other section that would move to Hauser would be 55A and 55B, and the combination of students from those two areas of Rayford Crest and Landmark Apartments is almost 90 students. They would move from Ford to Hauser, um, and then we would move. Um, I mentioned already zone 33F. Uh, this would create capacity for students at Lamar for us to remove to, to move students from Glenlock back to Lamar to their home campus. Now under this proposal, um, section 70A, which is the north side of Timber Lakes, would which is uh, would move from Haley, which is we have a, 11 portables at Haley, um, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, they would move from Haley to Glenlock. And if you're familiar, it's just right down the street. So um, we would get some relief at Haley. We would get some relief at Ford. We would have relief at Oak Ridge. We will have relief at Hauser. We will have relief at Vogel. Uh, Glenlock will stay pretty flat under this uh, recommendation. Uh, Ride won't get touched. Um, and we'll have to go back and look at that. And, and I think there's always, you know, and I want to stress about the discussion about bilingual, I think, and I will just say, programming is has not been a part of the zoning process. It's something we tend to do administratively. And so I just would say, well, somebody continue. Somebody, somebody start moving. The lights and so, um, <laughs> but we did look at it, I and we certainly. Do that on <laughs> Was the bill paid? Carrie did. Yeah. You know, we let anybody in here. Aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hines, yes. You, you can count on always getting this question from me. Moving these populations around, what does that do to these existing schools' SES numbers? Are we creating a Title I school where there wasn't, or are we jeopardizing any of these schools' current Title I status? Um, the one we're certainly, 
on the bubble. I think Lamar is on the bubble. We'll have to study that further until we get real numbers. They're currently not a Title I school, but they're close, and we think they might move into Title status under this proposal. Uh, Suchma should open as a Title school. Uh, the others won't change in terms of status. Uh, I would just hate to jeopardize anybody's I'm, Title funding by shuffling kids around. We understand, and we've certainly looked at that question. Okay, so <clears throat> didn't touch ride under the bigger plan of not having to move people twice, right? Exactly. It's a, it's another move uh, having to do with the western side of the woodlands, for example, rather than including it here. Because that is our recommendation. We feel like if we do it without really slowing down, taking a more comprehensive look, we don't want to undo something. Because part of the solution we looked at was splitting Jacobs Reserve. And, and once we split Jacobs Reserve, we feel like we're making a, a significant commitment for a period of time because we try not to move people very often. We really do. We really understand the amount of impact this has on families when we make a choice of changing where they go to school. So uh, we want to be careful, we want to be deliberate, and we don't want to do it and then go whoops or, you know, let's, right. let's change something back. Um, and we really want to look at this question in depth and study it because we did get some um, some information late in the process, the new demographic numbers that we wanted to take into consideration and study. But that's our recommendation. Is that we're not saying that we don't need to. Ride currently has um, 12 portable classrooms, and, and it's one that we wanted to look at bringing down the enrollment by some. Now, if you know over time they're going to level off and start to shrink, it's just not going to be for a while, and it's not going to be very much. Okay. Uh, and most of those schools that we're talking about over time, according to those demographic projections, will level off or begin to shrink, including Glenlock and Haley and Lamar. <clears throat> Dr. Hines, is Harper's Landing affected in any way? No. We did not touch the current uh, PAL zone. That was something that we looked at, though, and that's, there was discussion and it was in the option table. So starting such with this many kids in it versus the capacity, the way, we have two options there. One, make it a K-4 eventually, or ex extend the school, right? I mean, Correct. enlarge the school. I'm sorry. Not so over time, you know, we, we do anticipate we could go over. Um, we'd certainly like to get several years through so that we don't, uh, but then it becomes managing growth. At that point, we could eat, we have options. We could add on, uh, which we've done at that, that Flex campus. We have a kind of a 10 classroom addition that we've done at a few campuses. We just, our most recent was at Grangerland. Where we did an addition. Have we, we haven't done that at a two-story though. Can it be done the same? Or is that a technical question? I, somebody I, else? I, I know that they can do it. Know that they can do it. <laughs> okay. This guy can do it. Yeah, I know they can do it. This guy can do it. Um, so I, it, it can be. And the other one is managing through programs. So we have the ability to, to manage some growth through program. Um, the intermediate, I just wanted to feel obligated. I want to point that out. Since it's a K 6, you can see the big impact is going to be on Vogel. Uh, and this, you know, really that area in light blue, with the exception of that one. Uh, piece that would come from Grangerland um, is really carved out of the current Vogel. This represents um, what is Cox because that is Fox Run. So currently Fox Run, um, after they go to Ford and elementary, they switch to the Grand Oaks feeder zone. For uh, they go to they go to Cox, okay. um, and so that is. Um, there's some pros and cons. We've talked about them already. I'll just kind of resummarize those. Uh, the pro is that we create a boundary for Suchma. The, the, the downside is it is pretty large. Uh, we do get to reduce the enrollment at those schools that we're targeting. It does provide us some capacity at Lamar for uh, returning bilingual students to their home campus. Um, it does allow us to reduce our portables that are at Haley by thir that are currently at 13. We won't drop to zero, but we'll be able to reduce. Uh, we will slow the growth at Glenlock, we believe, through this, rec through this recommendation. Um, we believe this impacts fewer families than what was our one our 2.2 scenario. Uh, we zone, students in Zone 58, um, they only will have to leave their feeder pattern for elementary school. They'll come back. We do have split or inter, split intermediates throughout the district. It's not unique to just here. Um, 
And so students that are in 70A will move from Haley to Glenlock, but currently that same area goes to Wilkerson and they will still go to Wilkerson. So they will still go back to Wilkerson. Um, this does reduce, uh, reduce some of the crowding at Ford, which currently has six portable classrooms. Um, and the only real changes in intermediate are impacting, uh, are at Suchman Vogel. The negative, Hauser drops significantly. We, we lose a pretty good enrollment. Montgomery Creek Ranch is, fills up half of Hauser, and, and that neighborhood's gonna go to Suchman. And uh, so under this proposal, they drop down. It's not a bad thing, it's just, just a note. Um, and uh, the, another negative or the feedback we received is people that live along that 240 corridor, 242 corridor, certainly wish that they could have made it to Suchman because it's, they see it right across the highway. Um, this does not reduce crowding at Ride. It does not reduce the crowding at Glenlock that has five portables. Um, Hauser becomes a split campus under this. They'll have students that go to Vogel and that one section that goes back to Wilkerson. Um, and so that is a negative. You know, I said it's a pro, they only leave an elementary. It's also a negative, they do leave an elementary. Um, so those are some of the pros and the cons. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, I have a motion. I'd move to accept proposal 1.2 for attendance bounder. Second. I have a motion second. Gentlemen, discussion? No, here, here, no discussion. Yeah. This discussion is this is not an easy task. We really appreciate all the hard work that all those people listed went through and, and, and Dr. Hines yourself. There's a lot of moving parts to this, especially on a community that we have with so many schools close together and then you know, all these uh, subdivisions going up as well. It's it, it can be, be difficult and trying our, our your best and our best not to move kids two and three times from first grade to fifth grade can be difficult. So uh, I really appreciate the dedication and the effort that you guys have put into to putting this together for us as well. And the thing about Everyone. it, you can't make everybody happy, uh. but uh, everybody is convinced that you heard them. You know, I mean, even if you didn't, they didn't get their way. They were heard and they were consulted and they were what they were and their issues were discussed. And I believe we looked at every yeah. one of these comments pretty carefully. And Trust me, we believe you, yeah. Dr. Back yeah. Hines. Yeah. Observed on that, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Hines has become the uh, um, Yoda of rezoning, so uh, <laughs> he's figured out ways to take qualitative and and um, you know emotional characteristics and quantify them and run them. A hundred ways through Sunday. So trust me, when you pre present a proposal, we have full faith that it is the best fit for the district. Um, kudos again, like Dr. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Scott, <laughs> Mr. Hubert said, as well as um, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, husband's down the street here. Great job on everyone's behalf. We know there's a lot of hard work put into this, and a lot of decisions had to be made, and um, you couldn't appease everyone, as, as Mr. Husband said. But we know you did what was in the best interest of the district at large. So. Great job, Dr. Hines. Appreciate that. And team. Yeah, and was, uh, I could have, trust me, it was a whole bunch of people that are here. No, no. Worked on. We weren't getting you all the credit. No. <laughs> uh, so we have a motion second. No further discussion. All in favor? All opposed? All right, unanimous. Thank you. All right. Uh, item 5C, receive capital improvement update. Dr. Uh, no? That's easy foster. <clears throat> So good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Null. It's my pleasure to bring for you an update to give you some information on the capital improvements we have underway throughout the dis district. I'm going to start with Suchman Elementary, which is scheduled to open in August of 2019, as Dr. Hines just described. So the project is on schedule. There's no, uh, no hiding the fact rain has been our mm. biggest struggle. Uh, but as I reported to you last month, uh, we are nearing that point where the, we're getting more pavement and more building on, on the ground, so rain is becoming less and less of an issue. As you can see here from our uh, aerial picture, you see that description. So the concrete is most all the way around the building, uh, and the building structure is, is complete. So they're working on the roof deck and, and the other parts of that building to get it to what we consider a dry condition. On the inside, or rather, this view is of the outside, so you can see the front door of the building, so it's the personality of such elementary is starting to be evident. So you can see that the renderings that uh, Dr. Hines showed you as part of his presentation do turn into reality at some point. And on the inside of the building, which we'll get there in a minute, 
if I remember what my slides come up to. <laughs> uh, but this, this picture is really to show you that what we we're doing is stocking the site with as much material as the site can hold so it's readily available. So there's the, the masonry crews on the site, which is the majority of our building skin, uh, are running uh, about double what we would expect for a building of this magnitude. And that's in order to try to overcome the, uh, the uh, rain and whatnot that we've encountered so far. So they're, they're, they're doing what they need to do to keep this building on schedule and open it for the students on time. So inside the building, we're finally there. Uh, we're starting to stack trades. So what you're seeing is we would like to, in a, in a perfect world, let everybody have the building for their, per, their time. And so that leaves us room to start stacking things up. So while they're working on the outside walls, we've got folks working on the inside walls. So you can look through this picture a little bit and see the building systems, the ductwork, the piping, all that stuff is gone going. Uh, everywhere they can work, they're working to make time while the sun's shining to get, to get everything and open that, ensure that we open that school up for our students in August of 2019. Over at Austin Elementary, where we're building an addition to the main building that's going to help us remove some of the older portions of that building from service because they've reached the end of their useful life. So this is an overall picture of the new part of the project. So you can see the detention pond, the building structure, much like Sachma, is nearing its completion. Uh, on the uh, outside of the building, we're working our way around to the front door, so the new personality of Austin Elementary will start to become uh, visible over the next uh, several uh, weeks. And on the inside of that building, much like Sachma, they are working on the building interior, so the building systems. You can see the ductwork and all the other piping and wall systems here. And in the same vein, Austin's not as big of a project, so it's going to move along more rapidly because we finished that one a little bit earlier in the year so that we can have the summer to demolish the portions of the building that are going away, which allow us to redevelop for the playgrounds and other areas of that building that become the front yard as we change the orientation and how Austin Elementary fits uh, versus uh, or its orientation against Highway 105 in front. At Stockton Junior High School, that project is on schedule. It's scheduled to open in August of 2020, uh, and it is the building slab is, is complete at this point. The building structure is uh, moving towards the area of the concrete that's so complete. There's nothing in our way from a, a weather perspective now, aside from some big event uh, that Mother Nature decides, but we are moving forward just as we had planned on that, on that particular project. So uh, you can see the front door starting to take its shape. So over the next uh, few board meeting updates, we're going to start showing you the personality of these schools as they, as they become uh, near one month closer to completion. At Conroe High School, that addition and renovation project, last month we uh, showed you the finished addition. <coughs> that uh, addition now has students in it. They came back to school there when they came back from the winter break. So now we've moved into the main campus. This is uh, our current focus is the second floor of the main building. So some of the older classrooms in, the, in that building, you're seeing the demolition that took place over the winter break. Uh, so our goal here is to clean up uh, all the abandoned utilities that have been kind of installed over time as we've done addition to other, other work at that campus. And we're doing that to try to clean that up. As, as that's cleaned up, the new systems will go back in place and we'll start putting those building systems back together and then working our way through the building. That project is on schedule, and but we're scheduled to be there through 2019, so we'll finish it in December of 2019. And that is our update. Right. Thank you, Mr. Austin. <coughs> Questions, comments, good gentlemen? Good. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, item six, business finance, consider approval of 2017-2018 comprehensive annual financial report. Dr. No. Mr. Rice. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to recommend that the board approve the 2017-2018 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR. A lot of hard work goes into putting the district's financial statements together, and I would like to recognize the finance staff that is here this evening. If y'all show your hand. Thank y'all so much. Make them stand up. Great job. Uh, Sarah Roberts, partner with Weaver and Tidwell, and they are the district's independent auditors, presented a detailed review of the CAFR to the district's audit committee on Wednesday, January 9th. The audit committee voted and to recommend the CAFR to the full board for its approval. Sarah Roberts is here this evening with a short presentation and can an answer any questions that the board may have. Sarah? Over here. 
All right. Hot behind the. She's here. There you are. <laughs> this is not where I usually am, so sorry for the confusion. Um, as Darren said, I was here last week and presented, um, had a presentation to the audit committee, and I'm here with a shorter version, more summary version for the rest of you guys tonight, and I'm happy to answer questions at any point. Um, so I'll just get right into it. Um, our audit report on the financial statements expressed an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. That's a clean opinion. Uh, that's the highest level of assurance we can give that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. We issued a report on internal control and compliance, um, internal control over financial reporting and compliance. That's our governmental auditing standards report. That also was a clean report, no findings of material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, and no non-compliance material to the financial statements. The last report we issue is our report on compliance for major programs and internal control over compliance. This is our single audit or uniform guidance report for federal awards. In this report, we issued an unmodified opinion. Again, that's a clean opinion on compliance. No findings of material weaknesses or significant deficiencies related to major programs. No other audit findings of noncompliance. Um, the major programs that we covered this year were Child Nutrition, Title II, Part A, and the Hurricane Education Recovery Grants, that's the Impact and Restart Grants. Altogether, those amounted to $17.2 million, or nearly half of total federal expenditures. <clears throat> a few other matters um, regarding the audit. We identified no material misstatements. Any misstatements that we did identify, other than any that were completely insignificant or considered trivial, were corrected by management. There were no transactions entered into by the district during the year for which there was a lack of authoritative guidance or consensus. In other words, nothing unusual or out of the ordinary. No difficulties or disagreements arose during the course of our audit, and we had no impairments to our independence. With that, I'm going to jump into the next couple of slides, just a quick presentation of a few of the key financial statements included in the CAFR. The first is the governmental fund statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. This is like the income statement of a, of a private sector business that you might be used to seeing. Um, this statement presents the um, revenues and expenditures and changes in fund balance for all of the governmental funds. I'm going to focus here on the general fund. General fund expenditures were $478,799,674. And the net change in fund balance, highlighted down at the bottom, is about $3.9 million. And I just want to quickly point out that that is a positive net change of nearly $4 million after transfers out of the general fund of $18.2 million, which were funds that were transferred to debt service and capital projects funds. Unassigned fund balance as a percent of um, total expenditures was 27.7%. And for comparison, I've presented the information here from 2017. Um, expenditures were $457 million. Net change in fund balance was a positive $9.5 million. And unassigned fund balance as a percent of expenditures was 283 Million. So overall, very comparative. Um, either way, those ratios indicate about three about three months of operating expenditures, a little over three months, which is um, generally the, the benchmark. Included in the CAFR also is required supplementary information, including the budget to actual schedule for the general fund, the final variances between the final um, amended budget and the actual amounts, were that revenues were $21.2 million over budget, expenditures were $10.4 million under budget. For a total net change in fund balance, it was about $31.5 million over budget. Compared to last year, there were similar variances with revenues being over budget and expenditures being under budget. And these are, these are we're talking about millions of dollars. These look like really large amounts, but I would want to point out that this is 4% over budget for revenues and 2% over budget for expenditures, so it's really very close. Okay, finally, um, that's all business as usual, but there's a significant change in accounting principles that was implemented in this last fiscal year, yeah. and that is GASB 75, which is the OPEB standard. Some of you may have heard of OPEB stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits, meaning those benefits other than pensions. So here's the impact of this standard on your statement of net position. The statement of net position is the full accrual government-wide statement that shows all the assets and liabilities, long-term assets like capital assets and long-term liabilities like bonds and your pension. 
Here's kind of a summarized presentation of the components of your net position. The first thing you might notice, other than the brightly highlighted yellow amounts, is that your net position is negative, negative $79 million. The largest components are capital assets, about $1.3 billion in outstanding bonds, about $1.4 million. But this OPEB amount, the $239.5 million, is the impact of implementing GASB 75, which drives your total net position to a negative. For comparison, last year, I've included these amounts. You can see the negative unrestricted net position and total net position for 831.18, and the comparative amounts for 831.17, which are both positive. In red here is what your net position would have been at 831.18 if not for the OPEB standard. So you can see the net position would have shown a positive increase of about five to six million. To give you some additional context here, I know this is a lot of numbers and you may not be able to see it, but on my next slide I have kind of a pared down presentation of this. I have aggregated a random sample of 40 school districts that have June 30th year ends that have already submitted their data collection forms to the um, Federal Audit Clearinghouse and have listed their net position prior to the implementation of the new standard and their net position now. Hmm. What I really want to show is the count here, which shows that prior to GASB 75, <clears throat> 37 out of 40 had positive net position. Subsequent to GASB 75, only one out of 40 has positive unrestricted net position and 21 out of 40 have positive total net position. The ones highlighted in yellow are school districts that are included in the top 20 in the state in terms of enrollment, and I have isolated those on this next slide here. And I've included Conroe ISD at the bottom in bold with a similar count showing that of these top 20, 13 of them are included here, including Conroe ISD. Before GASB 75, only one had negative net position, and after GASB 75, zero have positive unrestricted net position, and only three have positive total net position. So this is a change that's affecting school districts across the country and across the state of Texas for sure. Any questions? All right. Uh, just on behalf of the audit committee, we did go through the audit, uh, the CAFR extensively. Uh, turned out to be a great report. I, I'm, I'm very proud of Mr. Rice and his team and all the hard work that they do each and every day to make sure that we present to the public the correct information. And it sounds like they did a great job again. And we say thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I would, uh, on behalf of the audit committee, move that we approve the CAFRs presented. Have a motion, gentlemen? A second to motion. Have a motion, second, discussion? <coughs> Anyone? All right, all in favor? Unanimous? Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, we're going to move um, legal, item nine, legal, A, B, and C above executive session, above the executive session. So with that being said, consider ordering a bond election for May 4th. 2019. Dr. No. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, as we've seen through Dr. Hines' uh, process today, we continue to grow. In Conroe ISD, we are today the 11th largest district in the state. And as of this morning, uh, we had 62,980 students enrolled in Conroe ISD. Uh, what was, we've that, grown, number? But, what was that number again? 62,980. Um, We've grown by over 15,000 students in the past decade. And just to hit a few highlights that we talked about last month, um, over those 10 years, um, we have had two bonds, uh, two bond elections that our community has supported. Our last bond was in 2015, and it was built as a four-year package. Um, over that 10 years, we've built 12 new schools. We've had multiple major renovations and additions, uh, significant investments in safety and security, program improvements in the areas of CTE, robotics, um, and we did that while maintaining the second lowest tax rate in the Houston area. Thanks to this board's leadership during that time, we also built an elementary school and multiple additions and projects 
totaling over $100 million from fund balance, thus not occurring any debt on those projects and not realizing the potential interest cost on those projects of over $63 million. In June of 2018, the board received information on the status of our current facilities as well as the long-term facility use plans. Based on that information, the board requested the passive demographic study. The study indicates that we will continue to grow at a rate of 13 to 1,500 students per year and have more than 76,000 students in the year 2028. This study is located on our CSD webpage and it's what well, anyone in the public is welcome to access that study. Uh, I would just note that before you hit print, uh, please pay attention that the study is 385 pages long. So be careful with print uh, on that. Uh, the board also authorized the formation of a facility planning committee to assess the needs of the district moving forward. The facility planning committee worked for months visiting facilities and evaluating the district's needs while always strongly considering the financial impact of any potential bond. I know that we have many members of our committee here tonight. I would ask that you would stand so that we could say thank you for your time and effort that you put in. Thank you so much. And, um, if you look back to uh, last month, we heard from Cody Bartlett as the spokesperson for that committee as he shared the committee's recommendation. The highlights of the committee's proposal were three new elementary schools, one new junior high, major renovations at Conroe High School and Oak Ridge High School, additions at Caney Creek, the Woodlands College Park, Conroe High School ninth grade campus, York Junior High, uh, investments in safety and security, life cycle, district-wide campus improvements and renovations, career and technical education facilities, district-wide facility and, and transportation needs, as well as technology and land purchases. The total of the committee's recommendation was $827,476,194.52. Through the efforts of our team and the feedback received at the board's workshop, we have made adjustments to the committee's recommendation. We have reduced the allocations to a few specific line items and removed the practice pool from the package. We believe these items can be funded using fund balance and future savings. Therefore, tonight we bring forward a package that will address all of the needs recommended by the committee at a total of $807 million. Using our conservative calculations, this package would result in a maximum three cent increase to the tax rate over the life of the bond, thus maintaining our status as the second lowest tax rate in the Houston area. It is anticipated that the impact on the 2019-2020 tax rate would be one cent. At this time, I offer this proposal for your consideration. Mr. Williams, um, I move that the board adopt the order calling school building bond election with the order to be revised to call the election for $807 million in bonds. Gentlemen, I have a motion. I second the motion. I have a motion, second. Discussion. Hearing none. I, I think it's just important to, to reiterate a couple of things that were said there about, um, you know, over over the course of several presentations tonight, we've, we've heard previous bonds have called for potential tax increases that did not materialize. We're you know we're projecting a potential maximum three cent, which may or may not materialize, and only one sent in that in that first year um, but still maintaining the second lowest tax rate by a large margin um, I think that's very important to, to understand Great. Great. let me just tack on that uh, several places we also heard tonight like 18 million in transferred to the bond side from from m and okay and Wilkinson at Wilkerson Elementary uh, being built out of cash and uh, many of our probably upwards of a hundred million dollars worth of improvements in other not necessarily standalone buildings but uh, safety and, and, and uh, some of the other concerns that our community has had to deal with <clears throat> have all been done out of cash so uh, and including even in this situation we continue to transfer money from our fund balance uh, in the in the anticipation of um, of the passage of this bond in, in looking forward and then on top of that, 
uh, we have trimmed back and agreed to do some things out of cash that will, uh, out of cash, out of, out of the expense side, that will lower this bond and make it even potentially less a tax burden. Whether it's two and three quarter cents, whether it's zero, whether it's three cents, it won't be four. It won't be three and a half. We're confident of that. And so uh, I think uh, I think this is a great, uh, we, we have to take care of our growth. We have to take care of our existing buildings, uh, the school districts. Uh, I believe I heard a report the other day, California had to pass a $20 billion statewide package to rebuild the schools that they've let deteriorate because of Proposition 13, if I've got that right. But uh, trust me, you can do life cycle now or you can pay the price later. So I, I commend the, the committee for recognizing that, I commend administration for being lean and mean, and uh, I recommend we move on. Mr. I, President, would be, oh, go ahead, Mr. Sanders. I was just going to say, I, I wanted to make some comments as well. Uh, first, uh, every member of the facility planning committee, thank you for all the time that you invested in going throughout, walking these facilities and understanding at the base level what's required. Uh, this is a large bond package, and it, uh, I believe that it's necessary as well. When you read, the, if you really dig into the PASA report, and it's massive, and it's a lot of data, uh, and if you're not a nerd with data like I am, I love that kind of stuff, then it, you, know, it, you can be overwhelmed. Um, and I don't mean nerd as a negative. I mean it as a positive. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's uh, how we took it. <laughs> good. Uh, it, it's, it's, it was my sense that uh, the growth is coming. And as a school board, it's a big weight on our shoulders because it's such a large dollar amount. But the growth is coming. And the alternative is... I guess we hold school in the amongst the, the parks and, and everywhere else. It's really difficult. It's a difficult situation when you think about we've got these great schools now. We have a great school district, and that's why people are moving to our district is because we have such great schools and we have such a great school district. And I believe that these facilities will help continue that growth and continue that great pride, I'm going to say, of, Con of being a Conroe ISD uh, graduate or, or someone who lives in Conroe ISD. Uh, and I, I just, I, I believe it's necessary and I'm all in favor. Uh, I'm sorry we had to cut $20 million. I hope that we can find ways as a board to try to make up some of those things that aren't, didn't make it into the bond package, but that we still will be able to do over time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President? I'd like to add, uh, I've talked to our, our, reg our uh, state legislatures. Many of you are probably aware there's some bond stuff changing going on, some funding changing in Austin. I would like to make an amendment that we accept the growth and safety items. I got an amendment on the floor. So you have to a motion. Have to get a motion on the floor. I substitute motion. Well, you can amend the motion. Amend. Yeah, amend. Yeah. Amend. Uh, amend the motion to substitute growth and safety bond issues versus the entire bond issue. Perfect. Got a motion? Um, a motion to amend the motion. Gentlemen, I'll have a second. Can you clarify for me what yeah, that uh, is? I don't understand what he's saying. Yeah, oh. I'll, I'll second it just so we can get some clarification. Well, okay. So okay. Oh, oh, let him, let it, let's not, make sure we've got to clarify the motion before we... Go ahead. To accept the growth and safety items listed, and I've printed out a copy of what that would look like, a copy for everyone as well as Dr. Noel as well as legal, and then see what that total does for growth and safety concern. The group, anything listed as growth or safety. So no new schools? Well, that would be growth. Elementary, Caney Creek. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, growth. Anything growth and safety. And I've, I've made copies that I can be happy to distribute, Mr. President, if you'd like them. Absolutely. I, let, let me ask it a different way. What is, what is excluded yes, from your sir. amendment? Anything that's not growth. No, I mean, um, so be specific, please. Hold on a second. Or how about life cycle? Hold on a second. Let's, let's see what we got here. Well, you have it totaled here, so. That's without the 6% annual increase. 
I think it's like 385 if you factor in the 6%. It's listed in the column that was presented to us. Okay, I'm going to try to re <laughs> and, and I, regurgitate I the, the, um, the amendment to the amendment. So I have an amendment to the amendment that we consider the proposed um, I don't I don't think we have an amendment to the amendment. We have you go to we have amendment. A, yeah, amendment to the motion. I'm, I'm sorry, amendment, amendment to the motion. To the motion of the um, that we pro accept the present the proposed um, items as the bond package. Here, no second. Here, no second. The um, motion dies. So the amendment dies. So the first amendment is still in play. We got a it's just the original motion. The original motion is still in play. Y'all don't get me. I'm gonna get it right. Don't worry. So we have a motion to accept the bond package as is, uh, 807 million. Uh, we have a f motion. We have a second. Uh, I just like to say, I mean, I'm good. Motion, sir. I just like to say, in the most simplistic fashion, as 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 Mr. Uh, Sanders mentioned, I moved here 18 years ago. My wife's been teaching the district for over 17 years. I have three kids in the district. Um, you guys have done a phenomenal job over the years as a district. Uh, Curtis, I know you and staff, most of the staff here were a part of that. And I think people continue to move here as a district because of what you offer as a district for as far as education, exemplary education, as well as the community um, that we get in being a member of the CISD family. And we really appreciate it. Um, no one takes that for granted. I love the way my house has appraised for almost double the amount over the last 17 years, even though I can't sell it now, so I got to stay put. Um, but that's that's a great thing, and the community at large, I think, appreciates that. Appreciate what you guys have continues to do year over year and be exemplary as far as the district and these bonds and continue to build new schools and provide life cycle updates. Continue to invest in our programs and our district and resources. All those things are needed. So. Um, I can't say enough how much support I have for this bond and the previous bonds if it continues to drive success as you guys have, have well demonstrated over the past. So kudos to you guys at large. So I just want to say I support it full heartedly. If, if I may. Go ahead, sir. I'd love to add something to this as well. So as a, as a school board member, I, I feel like one of the important things that we have to, or <coughs> I have to, to consider it's not just the budget, but obviously bonds, because that that has such a a huge impact not on just students and teachers, but every taxpayer that we have in our community. So I know that I, I take it a it's my personal responsibility to make sure that we go through this, and and I can I can I'd like to vouch for the uh, the school board members as well that I know that they have done the same thing that they take this extremely serious and. All the things that we've heard that are in this bond, the things that are not in the bond, which would be things that would be in a regular budget, on an annual budget, such as programs, raises, there's no new salaries, there's, there's, there's none of those things that don't belong. All of the things that, that are in this bond, they belong there, and they have <coughs> the students' best interests at heart throughout, and um, it's 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 not easy to ask the community come to to approve this you know 807 million dollars and then also put a, a tax burden on them to help pay for that and some may say that um, you know what's in it for me and as it was brought up before from mr. kid you know maybe those that have had kids before years before well they were the beneficiaries of others paying their way before as well so um, I appreciate the diligence. This was not easy. The school board, or excuse me, the school district, and all those that were involved, uh, they hustled. They hustled, and they they worked extremely hard, many times into the nights, and into the next day, and uh, that that needs to be noted. The, uh, the hard work that was put in to make sure that everything was presented, um, so we could do this in a proper manner, and and with that. I think this is easy for me to, to support as well. <clears throat> All right, Joe. I just yeah. really quick. I've been in Conroe ISD. I guess I went to school for a while and I've gone a few years, but over 50 years. And I just want to 
I know. <laughs> I'm going to reiterate that I do think it's a critical time for CISD, and, and there has been so much hard work, and we appreciate everybody putting into this, and I, I do think it's, it's so important and, uh, for our future and, and uh, for our investment in our future, which is our children and our students. And we're very proud. We have a long legacy at CISD, and, and this is, is very important. So I just wanted to thank everybody again, and let's do it. All right, gentlemen. All in favor? All opposed? All abstentions? All right. Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Noll team, everyone that was a part of this package. Really appreciate all those efforts. All right. Item 9B, consider approval of election services agreement with Montgomery County. Ms. Galatis. Thank okay. you. I'll just tell you about the next two items if you're really familiar with them because we just approved them a few months ago. The next two items allow us to, um, the county to provide the services Be for instant. our election, which we have been utilizing them for years now with um, excellent outcomes to run our election for May 4th. And then the other one is that we'll engage in the joint election um, with the other entities in Montgomery County that are having an election on May 4th. It's a cost savings for everyone and it makes it more efficient for voters. So I'd ask your approval of both of those three. So moved. Second. I have a motion, gentlemen? Second. Second. All in favor? In discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. All right, thank you. All right, executive session. Uh, consider the appointment of employment and evaluation, reassignment duties, discipline, and dismissal of public officer or employee, or to hear complaints or charges against public officer or employee included, but not limited to the evaluation of superintendent of schools and the level three appeal hearing for Aaron Croker. Um, here we go. A closed session of the board will now be held on matters contained in the notice for this meeting as duly authorized uh, by section 551. 074 of the Texas Open Meeting, Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, um, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be either shall be at either the public meeting upon reconvening of the public meeting or at the subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. It is, looks like 720. Is that, am I seeing that? 22. Right? 22. 22. Okay, it's 22, 722. All right, the board is now, the board is now in open session at? 7.51. There we go, 7.51, just because of that. The next agenda, <laughs> the next item on the agenda is um, level three appeal hearing from Ms. Ms. Aaron Croker. Uh, Dr. Noel. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Now, the next item on the board's agenda is the Level 3 Board Policy FNG Complaint Appeal of Parent Aaron Crocker. Yesterday, Mrs. Crocker notified the district that she would not be attending tonight's meeting. The board was given the record of Mrs. Crocker's complaint from both the Level 1 and Level 2 hearings. Typically, at this point in the meeting, the board would go into executive session and give both Mrs. Crocker and the administration an opportunity to make presentations. However, because Mrs. Crocker is not present, the board has several options. Let me just list your options for you. Number one, the board can choose to make a decision regarding the appeal based on the record alone. Two, the board can proceed to executive session and discuss the matter before making a decision in open session. Or you can go into executive session, hear the argument of the administration, and engage in any discussion before going back into open session and rendering a decision. At this time, what would the board choose to do and how would you like to proceed? I move that the Board of Trustees uphold the decisions made by the level one and level two hearing officers. Well, if I can, let me, oh. if I can go back, would you prefer just oh. to make your decision based on the record as it's been yes. stated? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, so the board has opted to forego closed session uh, and questioning uh, and rule based on the record. However, before the board can rule, I must ask each member of the board if he is able to serve in an impartial manner in consideration of this appeal. If any board member has been involved in any way with this matter um, to date, the board member should consider whether such involvement causes the board member to be unable to be impartial. Further, if any board member has a personal relationship, association, opinion, or outside information not included in the record, 
that the board member should also consider whether the board member can be impartial. Any board member may choose to recuse himself and if unable to serve should ask to be excused from participation. So this time I'm going to ask each of you individually if you um, can be impartial. Mr. Moore. I can be impartial and am able to serve. Mr. Husbands. I can be impartial. Mr. Kidd. I can be impartial. Mr. Williams. I can be impartial. Mr. Hubert. I can be impartial. Mr. Sanders. I can be impartial. Mr. Inman. I can be impartial. Okay. The board will now make its decision. <clears throat> the board can uphold the decisions of the level one and two hearing officers or, or the board can overturn the hearing officer's decision and the board can grant any relief that they feel is appropriate. Is there a motion? I move the board of trustees uphold the decisions made by the level one and level two hearing officers. Thank you. We have a motion, gentlemen. We have a second. All in favor? I'm sorry, discussion? Any discussion? <coughs> All right, motion second. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The no. district will send notice of the board's decision to Mrs. Crocker. And this concludes the level three hearing. All right, I need a motion to adjourn. I move that we second. adjourn. Second. All right, uh, motion. There we go.